Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Uh, let's wrap up a couple things with the story of Judah and Tamar. Let's look at Genesis chapter 38. Remember, uh, from verses 1 through 23, long story short, is that Tamar, she pretended that she was a prostitute, and Judah thought that Tamar, being a prostitute, then uh, bought her and then slept uh, with her for one night, but Tamar turned out to be his actual daughter-in-law, turned out to be his actual daughter-in-law. When Judah found out, then he's about to get upset. We're going to look at verse 24. And it came to pass about three months later. So meaning that uh, it just so happened, that phrase, and it came to pass, always means that. Three months later, that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. So uh, what happened was, it was told Judah that uh, Tamar, his daughter-in-law, played the prostitute, and then the people told her that, hey, lo and behold, uh, Tamar, she's with child uh, through that uh, fornication that you've done. So Judah, he was so upset that he said, uh, hey, uh, bring her forward and then let her be burned. Let her be burned. So that's what happened. Continuing on, so when we read this passage, Judah, he says, uh, bring uh, Tamar forward and then uh, burn her alive. Now, this is following the book of Leviticus chapter 21. Leviticus chapter 21. Basically, if there is a woman who played as a prostitute, then the Bible says that she was supposed to be burned. So Judah, he's following that kind of... Uh, regulation, so to speak, or that seemed to be a common sense rule during the ancient times. Let's look at Luke, I mean, not Luke, Leviticus chapter 21, <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 21, and then verse 9, verse 9, and the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. So that seemed to be the common sense rule during that time. Now there's something interesting right here, is that this rule applies for the priest's daughter, not just any girl. Now remember that Tamar, this might be interesting. Now I don't really believe in this, but I do believe in giving you the full information. Uh, I believe in keeping you informed. So Tamar, remember she was playing as a prostitute. When she played as a prostitute, I pointed out that it was more as a temple prostitute, right? It was more so as a temple prostitute. So if it connected to the priesthood or the temple, then Judah, he was thinking in his mind that be acting as the priest's daughter, but acting like a temple prostitute, she should be burned. So maybe Judah is following more literally Leviticus 21 uh, than we think. Meaning then, if that's the case that it's a priest's daughter that's supposed to be burned, then Tamar may have been a priest's daughter. If she was a priest's daughter, there are some uh, Jewish scholars who say that Remember Abraham, he was receiving tithes from a priest, Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. So they say that she may have been from that priesthood line of Melchizedek. Now me, I don't believe in that. The reason why is because Judah was messing around with Canaanites, and I don't think that the Mel uh, Melchizedek, uh, Mel Melchizedek's priesthood would have anything to do with that. However, I do believe in keeping you informed, and there may have been possibilities with this. Who knows, maybe Tamar, she may have been kind of like Uriah the Hittite, where she was a, uh, a pro, uh, she was a converted Canaanite. So from a Canaanite joining into uh, a saintly lineage. Or it could be that Melchizedekian's li uh, Melchizedek's line has been tainted somewhere along the line. However, uh, that's pretty much of a stretch, so I don't really believe in that, but I believe in keeping you informed. So that was one interesting note. 
All right, going back to Genesis chapter 38, we look at verse 25. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are am I with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, who are these? Uh, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. So uh, the text reads that when uh, Tamar was uh, brought forward, then she sent forth for her father-in-law by telling him the message as soon as the father-in-law came, by the man whose these are. So then she's pointing out, remember the signet bracelets and staff that Judah gave to Tamar. He, she says, uh, who, whose these items are, am I with child? Uh, by which man am I with child from these items that I made the deal with? She says, discern. So tell me, I beseech you, uh, who are these, the signet, the bracelets, and staff? Verse 26, and Judah acknowledged them and said, she hath been more righteous than I. So Judah, he acknowledges <clears throat> the items that Tamar uh, proved in front of the eyes of the audience. And then he admits that Tamar is more righteous than he is. Now, that's a huge confession, a huge confession from Judah. He could have lied. He could have gotten away with it. No one would have known what would have happened except him and his friends. But he acknowledged in front of his uh, friends, he didn't hide it, and admitted that uh, Tamar is more righteous than he is. That's quite a confession. He didn't just say that I'm in the wrong. He didn't just uh, plead uh, guilty and was silent about it. He admitted that she was more righteous than he is. That's quite a confession. That showed his humility. That is the greatest act that anyone could do that God would actually honor, believe it or not. Now, Judah, there is no doubt that he sinned greatly against the Lord. If you ever thought about why God would not put Christ's lineage through Joseph's line, uh, rather, uh, rather than Judah's, why did God choose Judah? The reason why is because God acknowledges the humble. No matter how wicked the person is, if the person has that heart of humility, God can be very merciful, give a huge chance. This should be a passage that everyone should know about. So the evidence we can see is Genesis 49. Genesis 49. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 49. <clears throat> now, we can see right here, there's no doubt that the reason why God chose Judah's lineage is because of his humility. Because when you look at Genesis chapter 49, verse 3 and onward, it's going by sequence from the oldest to the youngest. Oldest to the youngest. So the lineage of Christ should go always through the eldest, the right uh, of the firstborn, right? The birthright. Remember, Jacob had to steal that from his older brother. So it always goes through the older brother first. <clears throat> now look how God does this with the messianic lineage, the birthright. Reuben's rejected at verse 3, right? So Jacob, when he pronounces the blessings... Notice at verse 3, Reuben's rejected. Notice at verse 5, Simeon and Levi are rejected. Okay, then who's next? The next one is Judah. Judah should be rejected too, should he not, because of his wickedness? I mean, he sold his brother. But verse 8, notice what Jacob says. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. So that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So notice right here that Jacob puts the messianic lineage upon Judah. He doesn't put a curse. He doesn't reject him. Even though Judah sinned against God, why is that? Because look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. You can get a position of exaltation through your humility. You can get a position of exaltation 
to your humility. So that's why it is so important, church, and that's why I emphasize so much, especially for people. I know that we live in a very tough area, and uh, a lot of times we may covet other people's lives, other people's places, and sometimes that can go through my head as I pastor this area. But one thing that I've learned and the, uh, one thing that the Lord has taught me after the, these many years in the ministry is that if a person's heart is humble, then no matter how wicked or broken the person is, the Lord can use them and you'd be surprised how much the Lord can even exalt the person. Okay, that can be very encouraging to you. So like I keep telling everybody, just keep coming to church. That's it, okay? Just keep coming to church. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. The Bible says... Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Notice that he may exalt you in due time. So he will exalt you. He will exalt you in due time, at the right time. He never does it at the wrong time. He does that at the right time. So let's go to G Genesis 38. Genesis 38. So it's a huge lesson to learn from Judah's example. No, I mean, his sin is very grotesque. His sins are probably what majority of church members here wouldn't do. But notice right here that the Lord puts him as a positive reference in the word of God. So let that be a hope to any of you. When we look at verse 27, uh, Genesis 38, 27, And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. So verse 27, the phrase, and it came to pass again, it just so happened that during the time when she's about to give birth to twins, uh, travail, meaning her pain, giving uh, birth to children, that lo and behold, she has twins in her womb. And it came to pass when she, she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread. Okay, I'm going to interpret each and every word in the verse. Uh, this is, after all, verse by verse, word for word Bible study, so I will do my part. Verse 28, it's basically saying that it just so happened that when she was in pain, she's giving birth in pain, that's what travail means, that one of the twins in her womb put out his hand. So it's a male boy. When the hand came out, the midwife, so the midwife is the one who uh, takes care and then helps uh, bring forth the baby out of the womb. And then she took a thread and bound a red thread, that's a scarlet thread, upon his hand, saying this came out first. So. The reason why the midwife tied that red thread upon the baby's hand is to point out that this baby is the one that came out first so that they can find out which one is the older one. <clears throat> Verse 29, And it came to pass as he drew back his hand that, behold, his brother came out. But it just so happened that when he drew back his hand that, lo and behold, his brother was the one that came out first. So then the midwife says, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Pharaoh. So then she says, How did this just uh, happen to come out this way? That's the idea. How hast thou broken forth? So how did uh, you come out first? That's the idea. So this breach be on you. So then she calls uh, the baby's name Ferris. Therefore, his name uh, was called Ferris. Ferris means breach. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand. And his name was called Zerah. So after, uh, after uh, Ferris came out the brother, the one with the scarlet thread on his hand. And that baby's name was called Zerah. So Zara means sprout. The Zara means sprout. There's a picture here that we can compare when we go to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. There's a picture here. Tamar 
she pictures so much or she foreshadows Rahab. Tamar pictures and foreshadows Rahab because Rahab in your Bible, for some of you who don't know, she was actually a prostitute as well. But she became uh, the mother in the line of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now Tamar, she played the prostitute, but in her line, Pharis came out the lineage of Jesus Christ as well. Not only that, both of these prostitutes, so to speak, also had connections and used a scarlet thread before. They used a scarlet thread before or a scarlet rope. Look at Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, verse 21. And she said, according unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. So notice that we see a picture of God's mercy and grace. So we see God's mercy and grace upon a prostitute right here, Tamar, and then as well as Rahab. This bears uh, much to light what Jesus said to the Jews. He said that the prostitutes uh, made entrance to the kingdom of God before you. Why did he say that? Because he's thinking all the way back to Tamar and also Rahab. So truly these people made their way to heaven first before these Pharisaical leaders did. So Genesis chapter 38 is a great picture of God's mercy and grace. And then also a typology of Jesus Christ, uh, his sacrifice, his bloodshed, which shows redemption and grace. We see redemption pictured again right here. Uh, Genesis 38 is a great example of that. We are now in Genesis 39. Genesis chapter 39. All right, we're going to start off at verse 1, Genesis 39 and verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites. So, uh, meaning Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, he's an officer of Pharaoh. He's also captain of Pharaoh's guards. And obviously Potiphar is an Egyptian. He bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites' hand, which had brought him down thither. So the Ishmaelites obviously were the ones who brought Joseph down to Egypt. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. So God was with Joseph throughout that whole time, and Joseph became a prosperous person. He was, became a rich person, successful and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And Joseph, he lived uh, during that time in the house of Potiphar, the Egyptian, who became his master. Now, there are several pictures we can see, again, with Joseph uh, typifying Jesus Christ. Look at Zechariah chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11. Joseph is probably uh, the greatest typology of Jesus Christ more than anyone else in the Bible. More than anyone else in the Bible. So we see that repeated again in the book of Genesis chapter 39. We're going to look at Zechariah chapter 11 and then verse 12 through 13, verses 12 through 13. So notice right here that uh, Joseph, like Jesus Christ, was sold out. They were both sold out. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 through 13, the Bible says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver, of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So sold, Jesus Christ was sold like Joseph. Another example is Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. We saw from verse 2 of Genesis 39 that God was with Joseph, right? That's what the verse said. So verse 1, Joseph was sold out. Verse 2, God was with Joseph. 
Same thing, God was with Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 10, and then we'll read verse 38. <clears throat> the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. All right, let's go back to Genesis 39. Genesis 39. So Joseph picture so much of Jesus Christ again. There's going to be so many verses, so just be prepared to write them down. There's so many pictures right here that Joseph symbolizes or equates with Jesus Christ <clears throat> through typology, obviously. When we look at verse 3, the Bible says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So that's self-explanatory. Joseph's master saw that God was with Joseph and that God made sure everything Joseph did succeeded whatever Joseph put his hand at. Uh, we're, going to look at uh, we're going to look at John chapter 10, verse 41. John chapter 10, verse 41. People saw that God was with Joseph. People saw that God was with Joseph and then we're going to see right here, people see that God was with Jesus Christ. People see that God was with Jesus. Look at John chapter 10, and then we'll look at verse 33. Uh, 41, excuse me, 41. The Bible says, And many resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. So notice right here that the people, they see that whatever John prophesied about Jesus Christ, about God's hand upon Jesus Christ, they saw it come to pass, and because of that, they believed on Jesus Christ. Another one is Isaiah 53, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 53, and then we'll read verse 10. Whatever Joseph uh, put his hand on, it prospered. Whatever Christ put his hand upon, it prospered. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Notice that the prophet Isaiah prophesied about the future Messiah, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall, notice, prosper in his hand. Exactly word for word, like Genesis chapter 39, verse 3, the Lord made it prosper in his hand. The wording is uncanny. All right, go back to Genesis 39. Genesis 39. We'll look at verse 4. There's no doubt that there is a divine author to all of this. It's not uh, separate authors writing their own opinions. There's no doubt a divine author. Uh, he, what he wrote in Genesis, he was writing the same thing Isaiah. He had those things in mind. We're going to look at uh, Genesis 39, verse 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. So, jo uh, so Joseph was able to find grace in Potiphar's eyes, Potiphar's sight. So Potiphar was gracious with Joseph, and Joseph served Potiphar. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So Potiphar made Joseph in charge over all of his house, that's the overseer, the person who watches over everything. Everything that Potiphar had, he put it in Joseph's hand. Why? Because he saw how God prospered Joseph's hand. So why not put everything he has to Joseph's hand so that he can become richer himself? We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. So Joseph was made charge over everything in his uh, house, in his master's house. Jesus Christ is also made overseer. Everything in the master's house is given to Jesus Christ as well. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. See that right there? So notice that the Father appointed Jesus, 
like the example of Moses, was faithful in, over all the house. Keep reading. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he, as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. So notice right here that God is the one who built the entire house, but then Jesus Christ is the one appointed as the one in charge over all the house. Okay, uh, returning back to Genesis, returning back to Genesis 39.4, Genesis 39.4. Notice right here, the verse says, as I mentioned to you before, and Joseph found grace in his sight. Now go to Psalm 45, Psalm 45. Notice that the Lord Jesus Christ found grace in his sight. Psalm 45, and then we'll look at verse 2, Psalm chapter 45, we'll read verse 2. Notice the prophecy that's given about uh, Jesus Christ himself, thou art fairer than the children of men, verse 2, grace is poured into thy lips, therefore God hath blessed thee forever. All right, he's found grace. Jesus Christ has found grace as well. We're going to look back at Genesis 39 and then verse 5. Genesis 39 verse 5. Notice right here, and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house. So it just so happened that at the time Potiphar made him in charge, the watcher over everything in his household, and over everything he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for, Joseph, for Joseph's sake. So God blessed Potiphar, the Egyptian's home, for Joseph's sake. Now, notice right here, we're going to look at Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. Notice that God blessed others for Joseph's sake, as God blessed others for Jesus' sake as well. God blessed others for Jesus' sake. Definitely not for your sake and mine. All right? It's because of Christ's sake. So look at Ephesians 4.32. This is good. That, this is why we receive God's forgiveness, his blessing. Ephesians 4.32. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's wonderful, man. That's a wonderful promise. All right, let's go back to Genesis 39. Genesis 39. Because if, it, if Jesus Christ was not there, God would never have forgiven us. We would all burn in hell. Same thing with Potiphar. If he had not Joseph there, God's blessing would, uh, hand of blessing would not fall upon his household. Okay, we look back at Genesis 39 and verse 6. Uh, verse 5, let me finish that part. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So God's blessing was on everything Potiphar had in his own home and outside in his fields as well because of Joseph's sake. Verse 6, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. So Potiphar, you talk about him trusting Joseph that much. He left everything in Joseph's hand. And he knew not ought he had saved the bread which he did eat. You talk about this, <laughs> this man really trusted Joseph. So you should perhaps pretty much know the interpretation by now, now that I have explained each and every word, but just in case, the verse is saying that Potiphar didn't know everything that he ought to have except the only part that he knew about was the food that he was eating. So meaning that from uh, verse 6, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. The interpretation for those words is that everything that he had, he doesn't keep track of. He doesn't know everything that he ought to know about what he owns. The only stuff that he knows that he keeps track of is the food that he's eating. <laughs> food that he's eating, but everything, he just dumps it on Joseph's lap. You talk about complete trust. 
and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So Joseph, actually, he was a very good looking person. And he also had a, a attractable personality, well favored by people. So a person like that, oh, then the devil starts to move, okay? We look at, let's see right here. In verse 6, we're going to read verse 6 now. Uh, excuse me, uh, Genesis, uh, Matthew 28. I forgot to show you the picture. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. So all of Potiphar's was delivered to Joseph. All of the father's is delivered to Jesus Christ. Look at the book of Matthew chapter 28. Notice what the Word of God reads right here in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples uh, went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So notice right here that Jesus Christ proclaims that everything of the fathers is given to him. Uh, delivered to him. All right, let's go uh, back right here in verse 7 of Genesis 39. Verse 7 of Genesis 39. All right, so obviously the devil doesn't let, uh, leave you with a happy ever after, right? Every time when uh, the Lord blesses you and you think that you've overcome everything and you're about to live happily ever after, the devil always moves. Why? Well, one thing you got to get to your Christian mind is that there's no such thing as happily ever after the end, the devil's going to leave you alone. All right? The devil will always move. Why? Because he's not done until he's cast into that lake of fire. So it will always be the never-ending story. The Lord will always be there to sustain you, Amen. to bless you, to give you happiness. But that does not mean that it ends right there and uh, the devil, he's going to leave you alone. Right. So we see right here the devil moves. Verse 7, and it came to pass after these things, uh, the author, Moses, he just likes to use and it came to pass so much. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, so I don't have to explain what that means, all right? So it just so happened after all these things have occurred with Joseph's life where you thought that he would live happily ever after, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. So, <clears throat> Potiphar, uh, who is Joseph's master, Potiphar's wife uh, lusted after Joseph. She set her eyes on Joseph. Because remember, the verse said at verse 6, he's a goodly person, well-favored, successful. So, she says to Joseph, lie with me. Verse 8, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. So Joseph, at verse 8, he refused uh, Potiphar's wife's offer to sleep uh, with her. He said to Potiphar's wife, uh, Hey, that's what behold is. It means pay attention to this part. My master doesn't know. That's what it not means, right? Uh, what it means, no. He doesn't know uh, what is with me in the house. Because remember at uh, uh, verse 5, uh, it was verse, uh, excuse me, verse 6, uh, Potiphar didn't keep track of everything in his house. So Joseph's letting him know, look, the master doesn't uh, know anything that's in his house. He, house, he doesn't keep track. And he committed. He entrusted me everything that he had to my hand. So Joseph's trying to point out to Potiphar's wife that, look, this is a lot of accountability on my shoulders right here. So I can't just do this in secret with you because your husband entrusted everything to my hands and he doesn't keep track. How can I betray that trust? That's the idea. There is not, uh, okay, before I continue on, uh, I got to show you the other pictures right here. Let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Luke chapter 4. So, uh, Joseph faced temptation. Christ also faced temptation as well. Look at Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. 
So notice that Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil. Just like Joseph was tempted. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. To be tempted of the devil. All right. Uh, I said Luke chapter 4, right? Sorry. So uh, either one works. So yeah. <clears throat> Matthew 4, 1. Matthew 4, 1. And also Luke 4, 1 works as well. Okay. So sorry about that. If you go 4, 1 and 4, 2. It says, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and those days he didn't eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward a hungered. So Jesus Christ faced temptation like Joseph. <clears throat> All right, returning to the main text. Now, this is a great verse to mark down, okay? This is probably a great verse to help you conquer temptations as well. Verse 9. Now, this is the problem with our society, and you wonder why we get worse and worse, all right? It's because we lo lose this fo focus. As good liberals, we always think about sinning against our fellow humanity. But that's our stinking problem, okay? You got to get that out of your head. You got to look at verse 9. Joseph says, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. So Joseph's saying that no one has a greater position in this house than me, and Potiphar didn't keep back anything from me. He, so that's, he's again trying to explain his accountability, his responsibility right here. The only, uh, the only thing that Potiphar kept back anything from me is but you. The exception is you. That's what Joseph said. Because you're his wife, obviously. So the wife has a higher position. This is good. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against your husband? Is that what it said? No, no it didn't say that. Joseph says, how can I uh, do this great wickedness? How can I do this atrocious sin and sin against what your husband? That's not what it says. But that's why adultery is very common. Divorce is very common. Because you feel like that you're just, it's a fling, they call it. You're just doing a wrongdoing against your husband, and your husband, she, you know, your husband was lame anyway, so why not do this? And your wife was lame, and so why not cheat and do that? That's the problem with today's society, all right? It's not great wickedness against your fellow human right here, all right? Because we think about fellow human, that's why sin is downplayed. Do you see that? But when you put God in the picture, then that's why divorce and adultery and stuff like that would be pretty much out of the window almost. Why is that? Because we're not thinking about sinning against fellow humanity. When we keep doing that, then the level of sin is going to get deeper and deeper and deeper, and the toleration for greater sin is going to get greater and greater. Because, you know, when you wrong against your fellow human... Oh, it's not that much of a big deal. That's what it's going to turn into as time passes by because fellow humans get so much used to the same old sin problem. Right. Oh, we all do it, so it's okay. I get it if you were to do that kind of sin. If you did that against me, I would understand. You're right. I would understand, but God wouldn't. Right. Do you understand that? This is extremely important to understand. It's so important to understand that when we commit the sin, it's against God and God alone. This also is very eye-opening about us Christians where we're not very judgmental on each other. You might say, why is that? Because we understand that we're in the same position of sin. So if I were to tell you, you know, that you, uh, that you bolted out in Bible reading, prayer, church, or you fell back, I don't know, to the same sinful thought... You know, I won't be accusing you, oh, you're such a wicked sinner, how dare you, you're so messed up. I want to say that to you, I'd be the hypocrite, because I'm in the same boat as you. We'd understand, we'd pray for you, we'd help you, and I would probably tell you, look, you're not the only one in the church that did that. Everybody did that. So then I kind of help you out with some people, some people, they kind of feel guilty, and I'll tell them, look, look, you're not the only one, everybody did that. Now, see, I can say that, other people can say that, but no, not him. 
That's why in preaching, I can understand if you struggle with the same sin problem or you don't get right with God after a thousand sermons. Why? I'm in the same boat as all of you. So God understands human nature. That's why he's very gracious a lot of times. He doesn't smack your rear end and get you right immediately. He can put up with you for years because he understands the human nature side. See, God is merciful. That's why he demands us to do the same thing as well. So I can put up with you on that one. But to God, you got to realize when you walk out of the service, how can I do this great, great wickedness against God? No, it's not that wicked. It's not a big deal. Yeah, to you and me. That's our problem. That's why society has messed up. This can become an eye-opening sermon and an eye-opening thing when you go in through temptation and sin. You sin only against one being, my friend. And that's God. That's God. Look at Psalm 51. This is a great passage. Psalm 51. Remember King David when he committed adultery and murder? Now those are really atrocious sins that even probably uh, fellow mankind would agree with about murdering someone to get somebody else's wife. That's just awful. But look what the psalmist said, David. He realized that his sin was not against uh, his fellow human. It was to God and God alone. Look at Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. That's so important. You've sinned against God. And when you walk out the doors after preaching is over, remember this, you didn't sin against me, my friend. You didn't sin against the people in this church. You don't let us down, all right? Because we've all been through the same road before, all right? And we're probably struggling with the same things as you are. There's only one person you've let down, and that's God as soon as you walk out those doors. This is really good to keep in mind. Now, I want us to understand this is another eye-opening thing. Of course, uh, this is not to say that... Um, David, he did sin against Uriah, Bathsheba. If someone did you wrong before, for example, then obviously that person sinned against you and must be reconciled. But what does that mean then? Thee only have I sinned. The idea is this. If God did not even exist, do you realize there's no such thing as right and wrong? The existence of God demands morality. That's even brought up in debates among uh, a Christian apologist and even scholars today. The demand for the existence of God is morals. Do they exist or they don't? They only exist if there is a God. See, so because God exists, that's why sin exists and right exists. That's why when you commit the sin, you transgress only against him. Because no matter how much wrong you do your fellow human being, that don't exist if there's no God. This should be very eye-opening to you. So remember this, you only sinned against God. That's the idea. The only reason why you would sin against a fellow human being is because God exists. That's the idea. So sure, you might do me wrong, I might do you wrong, but that can only exist if God exists himself. So ultimately, it all transgresses against him. Do you understand that? If you wrong somebody else, you wrong God. In Genesis 6, when violence was in the earth with those days, everybody was killing each other. You know who they were transgressing against? God. It's not fellow human beings killing off each other. You're sinning against fellow humans. No, it's God that they're transgressing. That's got to be the most eye-opening thing that the world's got to get, but the world will never, ever get that. They will always remain humanist. Their scholarship, their education will always remain humanist. And when they remain that way, and they don't acknowledge that they sinned against the high being God, that's why they're all going to burn in hell after they die. 
Genesis chapter 39. Now we go back. My sermon's over. Genesis chapter 39. And then we'll look at verse 10. Genesis 39, verse 10. All right. Uh, the Bible says, And it uh, came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her. So it just so happened that Potiphar's wife just spoke to Joseph day after day, tempting him. But Joseph did not hear her out. He would not listen to her, to lie by her or to be with her, to sleep with her or to be even around her, not even around her presence. And it came to pass about this time, it just so happened around that time that Joseph went into the house <laughs> to do his business. So Joseph's just minding his own business in the house and there was none of the men of the house there within. So nobody was there in the house with him. Okay, you can smell trouble. You can guess what will happen, the wording of that. Verse 12, and she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. So Potiphar's wife, she takes that opportunity, grabs him by his clothes, telling him, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. But Joseph left his garment behind in her hand and ran away and got himself out of there. Okay, so look at Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, 15. Hebrews 4, 15. So Joseph did not sin against God. Joseph did not sin against God like Christ himself did not sin against God. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. All right, look at it right here. The Bible says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, that's Jesus Christ, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Everything Jesus Christ has faced the temptations like we went through, but he did not sin, just like Joseph. All right, now, look at 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2. Now, this was one of your memory verses about uh, resisting temptation, all right? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, what's very important to understand, if you want to have victory against temptation, it's not about, oh, I got to man it out, I got to tough it out, and then I got to just beat it. No, no, no. You have to play the coward. It's so important to play chicken and get yourself out of there. That's what Joseph did. Joseph, he played chicken. He got himself out of there. He ran away. He didn't uh, pretend that he was all charismatic and said, I will bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ with the chain. No, Joseph got himself out of there. You wonder why so many charismatics are caught in scandals. Okay. Yeah, because they thought they could face it. They can control it. They can manage it. Yeah, they got caught in a load full of trouble. Saying in Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, the Bible says, Flee also, youth, also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It's so important to run away from those situations. Uh, I see that quite often. Uh, in other church members' lives, and obviously in my own life as well. And I would urge people, uh, when I talk to them one-on-one, or in, uh, when I preach in a sermon, get yourself out of that situation. Because I know what's going to happen, because I speak for myself, is that if you think you can handle that situation yourself, and you don't get yourself out of there, you're going to uh, fall back again. Fall back again. So the best thing is to get yourself out of there. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You don't dance with the devil, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice that the Bible doesn't say uh, fight fornication. It says flee. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Run away as far as you can. All right, let's go back. Genesis 39. Let's go back. Genesis 39. And then uh, we'll look at verse 15. 
Genesis 39, uh, 14 and 15, 14 and 15. The Bible says that she called unto the men of her house. So Potiphar's wife, she, <laughs> she makes a big show now. So she calls everybody, all the men inside her house and spake unto them saying, so she says to all of them, see, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me and I cried with a loud voice and it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So meaning right here that she was saying in verse 14 and 15, see, look at right here. So she's trying to sh show them all her, dis uh, her distressed state and she's holding Joseph's garment, remember? So she's trying to say, see, look at right here. Potiphar brought a Hebrew here to all of us, so she's trying to get all the Egyptians on her side, see? So notice this, uh, this stereotyping, okay, that she's trying to do against the Jews. So before the <clears throat> particular group of people whine about, you know, people treating them in a racist manner, you got to realize since ancient times, th their ancestors did the same thing, okay? Let's just say that. You know why? Whether you believe it or not, even today, even today, you can pretend you're not, but even today, everybody still has an R problem, okay? From ancient times to now, okay? Yeah. That's the problem with people is that they pretend they are not. But notice right here that um, the uh, Egyptians, they had the stereotype against the Jews, so she's trying to summon them that way, that the Jews right here, they're mocking all of us. All of us. This Joseph came to me to try to sleep with me, and then I cried out with a loud voice, oh, save me. And then it just so happened that uh, when Joseph heard that I gave out my voice and cry out, that he left his garment with me and ran away, and got himself out of there. Now, that's a real dumb thing to do. That's a real dumb thing to do. Why, why would he leave his garment with her if he gets so scared and frightened by her crying out? He would grab his garment and get himself and the garment out of there. So this, this smells uh, very strange, obviously. But uh, who are they going to believe? At verse 16, and she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. Oh, see... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Verse 16, so she uh, uh, lays down, okay, so she sets aside Joseph's garment, and she keeps it with her until Joseph's Lord, the master, so her husband comes back home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. So no, Potiphar's wife, she's, she's so demonic, like, Notice this mentality, this victimization where she's blaming her husband as well. You see that right there? This is a huge example of what I see from a... No, I won't say it, okay? I'll get in trouble online, okay? But anyway, uh, anyway right here. So she, say, uh, she says, according to the same words, from verse 14 to her husband, that the Hebrew servant, Joseph, that you brought here to all of us, came uh, to me to mock me, to poke fun at me. Verse 18, and it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. So it just so happened that when I uh, lifted up my voice so that I gave out a huge cry that Joseph left his garment uh, with me and then he got himself out of there. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me. Okay, meaning that in verse 19, it just so happened when Joseph's master heard the words of his wife, that she said to him, After this manner, meaning such and such, like I told you before, did your servant to me, these are the actions he did to me, that his wrath was kindled. So Potiphar was angry. So notice right here that Joseph was falsely accused. Go to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. 
and verse 60. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 60. So notice right here that Joseph was falsely accused, uh, just like uh, Jesus Christ was falsely accused. Jesus was falsely accused as well. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse, fix, uh, verse 60. But found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. So notice right here that there were false witnesses against Jesus Christ. Before he was crucified, he was falsely accused. Returning to Genesis 39 again. Genesis 39 again. Let's uh, finish this chapter. Hopefully we can finish this chapter. Here we go. So in verse 19, uh, that his wrath was kindled. Uh, that's a phrase meaning that uh, uh, wrath is pictured like a fire. So when you kindle a fire, it sparks a fire, right? So his anger is being stirred up. That's the idea. Verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. So Joseph's master, Potiphar, took him and threw Joseph into the prison. This prison is a place where, more particularly, king's prisoners were bound. So Joseph was in the king's prison. That's where he was located. Now, we're going to look at two pictures right here, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, and Ephesians 4. Isaiah 53, and then we'll look at Ephesians 4. Now notice right here that Joseph was put into prison just like Jesus Christ himself was put into prison. Look at Isaiah chapter 50, uh, 53, Isaiah 53, verse 8. The Bible says, he, Jesus Christ, was taken from prison and from judgment. All right. Notice also that uh, Joseph, he was put into the king's prison. He entered the king's prison. Jesus Christ also entered the king's prison as well. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. When was that, pastor? Uh, don't forget, God the Father had Abraham's bosom down there. The Old Testament saints were bound. They were kept captive right there. They were in that king's prison, so to speak. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. That's the Old Testament saints in Abraham's bosom. And God the Father, the king's prison, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended the first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same. So notice right here, Jesus Christ descended into the king's prison where they were bound. The Old Testament saints were bound. Uh, continuing on in Genesis 39. The Bible says at verse 21, 21, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. However, verse 21 shows that God was still with Joseph and God showed mercy upon Joseph and made sure that the keeper of the prison, the warden, would find favor that Joseph would find favor in his eyes, in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. So the warden, he committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatever the prisoners did there, Joseph made sure that he was the one in charge of all of those doings. He was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison... Uh, look not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. Same thing like Potiphar. The warden didn't look at anything that was in his hands. Why? Because uh, God was with Joseph. So the warden didn't keep track like Potiphar. He just left everything to Joseph. He entrusted Joseph that much. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Whatever Joseph did, the Lord made sure that he prospered it. Okay, so there's another passage that I want us to look, and that will be on uh, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. We'll look at Acts chapter 2. This will be our final passage, Acts chapter 2, and then we'll call it a day. Verse 25, Acts chapter 2, 
We'll read verse 25. Notice here that uh, God showed mercy upon Joseph, right? At that verse. The Lord was with Joseph. He showed him mercy. Uh, the Bible shows that God the Father also had mercy on Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Acts chapter 2 and then verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, that capital, that's referring to Jesus Christ, right? So God had mercy uh, upon uh, Jesus Christ, even at the bottom of the prison, so to speak. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou, hast, um, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he seeing this before he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither uh, his flesh did see corruption. Okay, so we now will end it here. We'll go to Genesis 40 uh, next time, and then we'll continue on with the typology of Joseph. Also a little bit of biblical hermeneutics, which is very interesting. That's one of my favorite topics to teach on. We'll cover that in Genesis. Would you believe it? Uh, Ten more chapters, right? Or eleven? Yeah. Ten or eleven more chapters. We will wrap up Genesis. Would have thought. All right. Father God, I pray that Today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Open our eyes more to what your scriptures are telling us. Help us to feed on it, grow in it, and abide by it, and hide these words in our hearts. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.